Fácil. Yeah, okay. Well, I don't think I've done that. Yeah, like I, it's it's a the, the deadline has appeared in my head. Which book are you gonna write on? Um, probably the uh, not notes. So the one that you have. I don't like I didn't finish. Them. I didn't finish. Them. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I like I like fun novels when I read just some pages. Awesome, this book. It's graphic novel. Awesome. Oh, awesome, fun. I didn't, I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it either. But that's the only one that's like, because uh, if you want to do fun one, you have to like message him. Your mouse. Mouse. Yeah. I don't know. I'll figure it out because I haven't taken it. So. <laughs> they're pretty. They're pretty big. It's like okay. they pick like you know like a panel or a spread or oh, a teeth okay. and then write about like. Analyze that. Okay. Okay, there's two thousand. So for I'm doing mouse and I'm doing like the most like the animal masks. Oh that's number. Okay. I'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna um that last one you read like made me very upset. Like I was like, what why is she making her all these jobs? It's good. I do like fun. Yes, I think so too. Right. Talk about some Lagrange multipliers. Um, so Lagrange multipliers are an alternative method of optimizing a function with a constraint. And actually, it doesn't have to be a function of three. It can be you can have really kind of have any number of variables and do this. Um, but it's the less the variables we have, the easier it is. Get down to 16C to the May 3rd. Yeah, maybe. Um, so let me just ask, did did either of you watch the video from class from Wednesday or did you watch the end of the video where I did this problem using the Ronald Fires? The answer is fine. I, I'm I'm expecting the answer to be no. So I'm gonna do it again. But I just want to make sure no one's already watched it. Like even if you had it, probably still would it, but I just want to see it. So at the end of last class, we talked about let me, let me turn on the light here, sorry. There, that's better. Uh, yeah, better. Um, we were so we were doing this problem, which I'll set up right now, where we wanted to um, find the dimensions of the largest box whose length plus girth is less than or equal to 144 inches. This was, so the setup last time was essentially this. It was find the dimensions of a rectangular package of largest volume that may be sent by a shipping company, assuming the sum of the length and the girth cannot exceed 144 inches. So we've got this kind of picture. Our box. We usually imagine the length as the longest side. So I'm going to call this side the length, which we're going to call Z. 
And then the other two sides are going to call X and Y. And the girth is the measurement around the side that isn't using this, the length dimension. So the girth is this perimeter or measured around that way. So just like we were doing before, we're trying to maximize the thing. We're trying to maximize volume, which in this case is X times Y times Z with the constraint that the length plus the girth, so Z plus two X plus two Y, we could say less than or equal to 144, but since we want to make this box as large as possible, we should use all of the room we have and say that we're just going to say that the length plus the girth is going to equal 144. And then last time we solved for Z, we plugged it back into the other function. We took some partial derivatives, set found critical points, and then tested to make sure we had a maximum. And then we said, oh yeah. And I think last time we got that the dimensions were, I don't actually remember. I want to say, I don't remember. They were something, maybe 18, 18, and 36, maybe 24, 24. I think 24, 24. I could just look at my notes last time, I guess, but we got something. 24, 24, and 48. That sounds right. We're going to do the same answer again, but we're going to do it a different way. So we're going to use the method of Lagrange multipliers. And to do this, we do a couple things first. So we typically call the function that we want to maximize or minimize our, our little f. So we want to maximize little f of x comma y comma z, which is just x times y times z. And we're going to rewrite the constraint so that it's equal to zero. So our constraint, we're going to rewrite this as z plus 2x plus 2y minus 144 equal to zero. And then we're going to call the left-hand side of that our g of x comma y comma z. So our constraint is g of x comma y comma z equal to z plus 2x plus 2y minus 144. And we're always thinking about setting our constraint equal to zero. Then we're going to find this new capital F, which is right. Yeah, that's, that's the typical notation. So we're going to say that capital F of x comma y comma z comma lambda, lambda is the Lagrange multiplier, is equal to little f minus lambda times little g. And then from there, we kind of do the same thing we did before. We essentially find critical points or critical values by taking all the partials and setting them all equal to zero. So let's actually write this out. So our f of x comma y comma z comma lambda is equal to our thing we want to maximize, x times y times z minus the lambda times our constraint, z plus 2x plus 2y minus 144. And then we're going to take all the partial derivatives. So we're going to find the partial with respect to x. That's going to be y times z minus lambda times the derivative of the insides with respect to x is just going to be 2. We're going to find fy. It's going to be x times z minus lambda times the derivative of the inside here is also 2. With respect to y. And finally, not finally. Nextly, fz is going to be y, xy minus lambda times 1. And finally, something I don't think you need to write, I'm going to write that anyway, the partial with respect to lambda is going to be, well, that's a 0 there, the derivative of xyz is 0 as far as lambda is concerned. Then you're going to get a minus 1 times z plus 2x plus 2y minus 144. And the reason I don't think you need to actually write down this part is because the next step is we set all of our partials equal to zero. But setting this equal to zero, if you multiply both sides by negative one, this is equivalent to just saying z plus 2x plus 2y minus 144 equal to zero. This is just your constraint. 
I don't think we need to write the constraint equation again because we've already got it way up there. Sorry, I can't see that. Way up there. So you can find it, but again, you've already got that equation. F lambda is always just going to be your constraint equal to zero. So now the fun part. Our job is to figure out what X, Y, and Z. We don't really ever actually have to find them. Some people like to. Sometimes it's necessary, but usually it's not. Usually, and again, this really kind of varies. Usually what people do at this stage is they take each of these equations, not the last one, and they isolate lambda. So we're going to rewrite this as yz equal to 2 lambda or yz divided by 2 equal to lambda. Same deal here xz equal to 2 lambda, or xz divided by 2 equal to lambda, and finally, xy equal to lambda. Um, you don't always have to divide off the constants. I don't think your professor did when she was doing it, which is totally fine. Um, and then we set them equal to each other. I like isolating lambda specifically because then it's really easy to just be like, oh yeah, I'm going to set that equal to that, or that equal to that, or that equal to that. So let's set the first two equal to each other. Setting these two equal to each other, we're going to get yz over 2 equal to xz over 2. Now, the maybe kind of not best way to do this, but what most people do, is to multiply both sides by 2. That's fine. And then technically, normally I would advise against dividing both sides by a variable. Like I wouldn't usually divide both sides by z. But it's kind of what people do. The real thing we should do is actually bring everything to one side and say y z minus x z equals zero and factor out a z. And then you either get z equal to zero or y equal to x. But the thing is, z equal to zero is not going to be the right answer because um, what are we trying to do? Maximize the volume of this box. If z is zero, that's not good. So that's why it's usually often okay to divide by a variable because we typically don't want z equals zero or x equals zero or y equals zero as an answer. So we often kind of are a little bit less careful with our algebra. So great, we've got y equal to x. That means whatever x is, y has to be and vice versa. And then we're going to take a different pair of equations. Let's take, let's see, what do I want to pick here? Let's take the second and the third one. So I said those two equal to each other. So now I've got xy equal to xz divided by 2. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2, say 2xy equals xz. And I guess I'll try to be appropriate here and bring everything to the left. 2xy minus xz equals 0. Factor out an x. You're left with 2y minus z equals 0. So either x equals 0, which we know we don't want, or z equals 2y. My usual plan of attack is to get all the variables in terms of one of the variables. So what I'm noticing here is I can write x in terms of y and z in terms of y. Essentially, whichever variable is showing up twice, you want to make everything come out in terms of that variable. So now we take our constraint equation which was z plus 2x plus 2y equal to 144. And we plug in so that we only have one variable. So if I plug in z equal to 2y and x equal to y, I'm going to get 2y plus 2y plus 2y equal to 144, which means y is going to equal 144 divided by 6, which is 24. And then if y equals 24, x equals y means x also equals 24. And if z equals 2y, z is going to equal 2 times 24, which is 48. We get the same numbers. The only kind of drawback to using Lagrange multipliers is there isn't just a test to see, like, do I have a max or do I have a min? 
you kind of have to just convince yourself that it is the thing you want it to be, which is not lovely. But it is a maximum. How do I know? We did it the other way and it was a maximum. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's not, unfortunately, you're kind of like, well, yeah, if they're asking me to find a max, it's probably going to be the max. There's not really any other way to do it. So questions about any of this before we do a few more examples. So the constraint, so the constraint for this problem was given. Oh. So they told us just you're mailing this package, and the post office says we require the length plus the girth of your package has to be less than 144 inches. So in this problem, the biggest box we can send through the mail is 24 inches by 24 inches by 48 inches, which is two feet by two feet by four feet. It's a pretty big box. Um, and that'll have a length plus a girth of 144 inches. But often the, often the constraint will be either written out in words or given as an equation. Like, let's look, so let's look at another example. Because usually the constraint is not too hard to discern if we read the questions. Let's see here. Let's say we want to find, deal with the following. So here's one where they're just giving it to us. We're told to minimize f of x comma y comma z equal to 2x squared plus 3y squared plus 2z squared with the constraint of, and I'm going to write g of x comma y comma z, even though they have not written this in the textbook, equal to x plus y plus z minus 24 equal to zero. Or in other words, minimize this function and the point that we're going to find has to be on this plane, x plus y plus z equal to 24. It looks a little bit gross, but really it's the same thing we did before. We're going to, we're going to write capital F, capital F of x comma y comma z comma lambda. It's going to be little f. minus lambda times g. And I would like the three of you, and those of you on Zoom as well, to go ahead and find your partial derivatives fx. There's a spider right there. Okay, sorry, spider, you know, but you're right on my keyboard. It's unacceptable. Okay, so find those three partial derivatives. So your partials should be 4x minus lambda times 1. Fy should be 6y minus lambda times 1. And Fz should be 4z minus lambda times 1. And anything else I want to say here? I, again, I don't think we need to write down F lambda. Right? Your F lambda is just x plus y plus z minus 24 equals 0. Right, that's what your F lambda is. It's just your constraints. Um, so then all these, if we set them all equal to zero, it's really straightforward to solve for lambda. You're going to get lambda equal to 4x. You're going to get lambda equal to 6y. You're going to get lambda equal to 4z. So looking at these, 
which two variables have to be equal to each other? X and Y, X and Z, or Y and Z? Yeah, X and Z. Right? If we set those two equal to each other, we see, oh yeah, 4X equals 4Z, you get X equal to Z. And then picking a different pair, like X and Y, for example, if you have 4X, or I should say, lambda equal to 4X, lambda equal to 6Y, you get 4X equal to 6Y. And here's the thing I've noticed over the years. I can see from these equations that X is showing up twice. So I would like each of the other variables to be isolated in terms of X, meaning I'm thinking of this as Z equals X. And here I want to solve for Y by dividing both sides by six. So I want to say that four sixths X is equal to Y or two thirds X is equal to Y. So that I can replace Y with a thing with X and Z with a thing with X. Um, yeah. People do this all sorts of weird ways, by the way. Seem good? It's okay if it doesn't. No, I want, so, so here's the thing, right? So if I go back to this equation, X plus Y plus Z equal to 24 or minus 24 equals zero, I want to end up with just one variable. So I want to replace the Y with the X thing and the Z with the X thing. So, so yeah, it, it, it always feels a little backwards to me as well, but I'm like, oh yeah, I really want this to be X plus Y is going to be four, six. I really should write two thirds X and Z is going to be X equal to 24. And instead of trying to add fractions, let's just multiply both sides by three. So that we get three X plus two X plus three X equals three times 24. Three plus two plus three is eight. Eight X equals three times 24. So X is equal to three times 24 divided by three. 24 divided by three is eight. Except I'm not dividing by three. I'm really dividing by. If eight X equals three times 24, then X should be three times 24 divided by eight, not by three. And then 24 divided by eight is three, and three times three is nine. So X equals nine. Y is going to equal two thirds times nine, which is going to be six. And Z is also going to be equal to X, so Z is going to be equal to nine. So these are the three numbers that add up to 24 who, that minimize this expression up here. Interesting. Um, yeah, no. Let's do another one because there's something I want you to see. And I'm just grabbing problems from section 7.6 here because there's some good problems in the textbook. Um, so these next two, I want to point out have something in common. So I want to maximize. Um, sure, let's do that one. F of X, Y, Z equal to X times Y times Z with a constraint of, of X plus Y plus Z minus six equal to zero. And we're going to show the work here, but I want you to see something. In each of these equations, you could interchange any two variables and still have the same equation. In the first equation, if you interchange X and Y, you'd have Y times X times Z, still the same. Over here, you'd have Y plus X plus Z minus six, still the same. And if that's true, that you could take any two variables and interchange them and still have the same equation, what it typically means is we have symmetry, which means I'm expecting my answer for X, Y, and Z to all be the same. Meaning I'm expecting my answer to be X equals two, Y equals two, Z equals two, because those are the three numbers that add up to six and are all the same. And that is something that you can generally rely on being true. So I would encourage you when you see something like, like, oh yeah, I think X plus Y, X, Y, and Z are all going to be a third of six, which is equal to two. Well, let's actually do it. So our F of X comma Y comma Z comma Lambda is going to be X times Y times Z minus Lambda times X plus Y plus Z minus six. 
the point right equal to zero at the end of that. I should not be trying to write if equal to zero at the end of that. My fx is going to be yz minus lambda times one. My fy is going to be xz minus lambda times one. My fz is going to be xy minus lambda times one. So do these equal to zero, and we can really see quickly that lambda is going to be yz or xz or xy. And then if we set any two of these equal to each other, so in the first two equal to zero, equal to each other, we get yz equal to xz. And technically, if you do the whole bringing everything to one side and factoring, you're either going to get z equal to zero as a solution or y equal to x. But in this case, we're trying to maximize x times y times z. z equal to zero is not a good answer. And then using the second two, same sort of deal. We're going to get xz equal to xy. That's going to result in either x equal to zero, which is no good, or z equal to y. So look, everything is the same as everything else. y equals x, y equals z, which also means x equals z. So taking my constraint equation and replacing x, x with y and z with y, my x plus y plus z minus 6 equals 0 becomes y plus y plus y equals 6, or y equals 2. And if y equals 2, z equals 2, and if y equals 2, x equals 2. And that's a pretty common occurrence. So let me, we're, we'll look at one more, another example that has the same kind of trait, but we're not going to work through it. But I want to show you kind of just how you could, you should, I'm going to give you one that you should work through on your own. Um, where'd you go? So let's look at this one here. So we want to minimize f of x comma y comma z equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared with a constraint of x plus y plus z equal to one. So I see the same sort of feature as the previous one that I could interchange any two variables and end up with the same equation. So I'm pretty confident that x equals y equals z. They all end up being the same, which means this constraint equation really just becomes x plus x plus x equals 1, which means x equals 1 third, which means then y and z would also be 1 third. So I would encourage you all to do the work on your own and show that your solution is going to be x equals 1 third, y equals 1 third, z equals 1 third. Occasionally, there are things that make this idea a little weird and not work out exactly perfectly, but it's something good to have in the back of your mind. Oh, yeah, everything is kind of interchangeable. I can be fairly confident that all the things have to equal each other, which means I can plug that into the constraint and get whatever value you get. Let's look at some more interesting questions. So I personally like the problems where they actually like give you a bunch of words and you have to kind of figure out what's going on. So let's look at the following one. Sure. Okay. So we're going a little bit of writing. So a manufacturer has an order for a thousand units of fine paper that can be produced at two locations. We'll call them, so it will say, let X1 and X2 be the numbers of units produced at the two plants. 
locations. Find the number of units that should be produced at each plant. to minimize the cost if cost is given by C equal to 0 0.25 X1 squared plus 25 X1 plus 0 0.05 X2 squared plus 12 X2. Kind of a lot of words for not a lot of information to actually be written. So we should have two equations to have to, to look for here. We have the thing we want to optimize and our constraint. So we're being asked to minimize the cost. So this cost function here is our function we want to optimize, which we usually label as little less. Great. So our f of x1 comma x2 is this messy thing. What's our constraint? Well, if we read the question, we should be able to figure it out. The manufacturer has an order for a thousand units of fine paper. Oh, well, that means we need that the two amounts of papers we have, x1 and x2, that has to add to a thousand. So our constraint, is the x1 plus x2 has to equal a thousand. Now let's write it as x1 plus x2 minus a thousand has to equal zero. And that's our G of X1 from X2. To me, it's assuming you only have two variables. It feels a little funny to use Lagrange multipliers. It feels like it'd be much easier kind of just to plug this into the other equation and do it the typical way, but that's not what we're being asked to do. So we're gonna use Lagrange multipliers. We're gonna write that our F of X1 comma X2 comma Lambda is equal to all that 0.25 x1 squared plus 25 x1 plus 0.05 x2 squared plus 12 x2 minus lambda times x1 plus x2 minus 1,000. And then we're going to find our partials. Our partial fx1 is going to say 0.25 times 2x1 is going to be 0 0.5 x1 plus 25 minus lambda times one. And our f x2 is going to be uh, the derivative of 0 0.05 x2 squared is going to be 0 0.1 x2 plus 12 minus lambda. And we're going to set each of those equal to zero. And then we're going to get some relationship between our two variables. So solving each of those for lambda, we get lambda equal to 0.5x1 plus 25. Bottom one is lambda equal to 0.1x2 plus 12. And then we're going to set those equal to each other. So 0.5x1 plus 25 equals 0.1x2 plus 12. I'm not loving dealing with decimals here, so I'm going to multiply both sides by 10. So 5x1 plus 250 equals x2 plus 120. And since x2 already has a coefficient of 1, I might as well just isolate it and say that x2 is equal to 5x1 plus 250 minus 120 is 130. I'm going to take that. I'm going to substitute that back in to my constraint. So the whole deal with these Lagrange multiplier equations, from my perspective, is that you're always trying, basically, however many variables you have, you're trying to write all but one of them in terms of the other one. So when it's x, y, and z, we're trying to write x and y in terms of z, or x and z in terms of y, or y and z in terms of x. When you just have two, you're just trying to write one of them in terms of the other one. So here, I can just rewrite this as x1 plus this thing for x2, my 5x1 plus 130 minus 1,000, or just let's say equal to 1,000. And then we can solve for x1. We get 6x1 
equal to 1,000 minus 130 is 870. So x1 is equal to 870 divided by 6, which is something. Mm, I should know what that is. I think it's 145. Yeah, that's right. Because you multiply 6 times 150, you get, you get 900. So yeah, that's right. So x1 is 145, which means then that x2 has to be the rest. x2 is going to be 1,000 minus 145, which is going to be 855. And I don't think if they get really any worse than that. I don't feel like they really do. And I can check one thing here. No, yeah. Sometimes, no, I don't think, yeah. Occasionally, there are problems where you have two different constraints and you have to use two Lagrange multipliers, meaning a lambda and another variable, we usually call it mu. I don't think that's something we typically do in this class. Um, I certainly don't see any problems in the textbook that address that at all. Double checking though. No, yeah. Oh, we should do one like that, but yeah, let's do one of those. Okay, so. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. So you don't always have to have just three variables. So let's say we want to do the following. We want to maximize. Oh, I was trying to I was trying to write numbers here. Yeah, I can put number six and four. Maximize f of x comma y comma z comma w equal to two x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus two w squared with the constraint. that 2x plus 2y plus z plus w is equal to 2. Which I guess we could write as minus 2 is equal to 0. I will point out, it doesn't actually matter where the constant is. If you put the 2 on this side or on this side, it's not going to change what your partial derivatives are. Is that constant there when you take the partial derivative is just going to be zero. When you take the derivative. Um, all right, let's write down all the things. So our f of x comma y comma z comma w comma lambda is all of this. 2x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 2w squared minus... To I always forget to write the lambda. The lambda times the 2x plus 2y plus z plus w minus 2. Okay, and then we're going to take all of our partials. fx, y, z, w. I'll point out this is your f lambda, essentially. All right, so taking the partial of this with respect to x, we're going to get 4x, and the partial here is going to be minus lambda times 2. Um, set that equal to 0, and then we do the same thing for the rest. We're going to get a 2y minus lambda times 2. We're going to get a 2z minus lambda times 1, and we're going to get a 4w minus lambda times 1. And then, yeah. So I want to point one thing out here. Um, do I really? Yeah, I kind of know. Sure. So solving for lambda here, we get 2x equal to lambda. Solving for lambda here, we get y equal to lambda. Solving for lambda here, we get 2z equal to lambda. And solving for lambda here, we get 4w equal to lambda. Oh, that's the other thing people do sometimes. So here's what I'm seeing here that looks kind of terrible. I'm going to have to set some number of these equal to each other to get everything towards one variable. And the field is just kind of gross. Not impossible, kind of gross. 
Sometimes what people do, and it's a valid thing to do, and that's what we're going to do here, is instead of solving, isolating lambda for each of these and sending a bunch of these equal to each other, we could solve each of these for in terms of lambda, meaning instead of saying 2x equals lambda, we could say x equals lambda divided by 2. And y equals lambda and z equals lambda divided by two, and w equals lambda divided by four. And then we could replace each of x, y, z, and w in our constraint equation with what they're equal to in terms of lambda. So then our two x plus two y plus z plus w equal to two is, beginning, is gonna become two times lambda over two plus two times lambda, plus lambda over two, plus lambda over four, equal to two. And then instead of trying to add fractions like a fool, let's just multiply everything by four. So this length, so if I multiply everything by four, I'm gonna get four times lambda, plus four times two lambda, plus four times lambda over two is gonna be two lambda, and four times lambda over four is just lambda, and that's gonna equal two times four, which is eight. So on the left-hand side here, I have four plus eight plus two plus one is gonna be 15 lambda equal to eight. So lambda is equal to eight fifteenths. Not that we ever actually have to find lambda, but here it's convenient. Then we can go back and say, okay, great. X is gonna equal one half, times 8 fifteenths, which is 4 fifteenths. And y is going to equal 8 fifteenths. And z is going to equal lambda, by, <clears throat> lambda over 2, which is, again, 4 fifteenths. And w is going to equal 1 fourth times 8 fifteenths, which is 2 fifteenths. This is not the way I usually go when I'm doing a Lagrange multipliers question. I don't love solving for lambda generally, but it does totally work. And depending, especially if, especially if each of your partials only has like one X or one Y or just one variable once, it's often a thing you can do relatively easily. Um, looking back here at one of these previous ones for just a second. No, none of these are really good candidates. That one would have been so. This one here, this one we did back here when we were minimizing the two x squared plus three x squared plus two z squared, given the constraint x plus y plus z minus x plus zero. An alternative route we could have taken would have been to have said x equals lambda over four, y equals lambda over six, and z equals lambda over four, and then plug those three things into this equation. In fact, let's go ahead and do it. We have a minute here. We go back there and plug those in. We have lambda over four plus lambda over six plus lambda over four equal to 24. And then multiply everything by 12. Yeah, by 12. Well, 12 by 24, 288. It's really just 12 times 12 times two. And then multiplying all these things by 12, you get three lambda plus two lambda plus three lambda. So you have eight lambda equal to 288. So lambda is equal to 288 divided by eight. You're just dividing by two, three times. So 144, 72, 36. So lambda is 36. X is 36 over four, which is nine. Y is 36 over six, which is six. Z is 36 over six, sorry, over four, which is nine. So this does work. It's just not always convenient to do. Cool. I always, I always kind of forget about doing that, to be honest. But it, it is a valid way of doing it. It's just not always the best way. All right. It's 153. It's Friday. We can just call it a day. Okay. Have a lovely weekend. Um, watch out for the weather tomorrow. It's supposed to be kind of gnarly, rainy. Cold. So have a lovely rainy weekend and um, see you all on Monday. Make sure you fill out the attendance form if you, if you have not already.